the group here will show that all commission members are present. And we're welcoming our liaison, Eric uh, Friedman, from council today, replacing uh, Kristen Snedman. So um, any changes to the agenda? Uh, Mr. Chair, no changes. Okay. Any public comment for items that aren't on the agenda? See no slips running around. And a couple consent items. The first one are uh, meeting minutes approval from the September 20th meeting. Does anybody have any changes or suggestions to that or a motion to accept? Motion to approve. I'll second. That's um, motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Any disapprove? Nope. And then the authorization to increase funding for the Bureau of Recl Reclamation Warrant Act, et cetera. Do we need uh, a quick narrative on that or not? Nope. So, Questions or comments from uh, the board, the commission? Nothing? So if I could get a motion to approve that. Motion to approve. Thank you. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes unanimously. And so we'll move on to our uh, first uh, real item, the stage three drought update. Out. I'm going to get talking sometime. <laughs> drought update. Take it away, Ms. Dyer. All right. Did you want to give any introductory remarks? On, OK. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Kelly Dyer, I'm the water supply manager, and we have a joint uh, presentation this morning we're doing something a little bit different than our normal dr uh, drought update um, we are going to be um, providing a drought condition recap um, I will be going into a little background on our drought planning and some of the basis of our policies and management decisions um, and we'll go over our updated water supply strategy and then um, we'll turn it over to Ms. Wood, our water conservation supervisor, to, to discuss our demand, man demand management strategy. She'll also be giving an overview of um, water use regulations and what are some options moving forward as the drought continues, assuming it continues for an extended period. Um, and then we will hand it over to Ms. Brooke, who is in our community development department um, to discuss water demand from new development. Just, it's really an informational presentation. We're not uh, making any recommendations or um, taking any actions at this point, but it's information for the Water Commission to know how much uh, water is being used by new development and then also um, how much water could be saved with additional water use restrictions. So our rain totals for the current water year, which um, this is the county's water year starting September 1st, um, we're at about 0.18 inches at Gibraltar Reservoir, 0.21 inches at Kachuma, and one inch in downtown Santa Barbara. And so it's just the beginning of the water year. We get most of our rainfall and inflows to our reservoirs in the January through March period, um, but this is somewhat of a nice start to at least have something on the books. Um, NOAA forecasts a chance of a weak El Nino developing during the fall and winter. And so um, I'm not going to speculate whether that means anything <laughs> to us at this point, but at least it's um, not showing dry conditions. So our area, they're forecasting for the next three months equal chances of above normal normal or below normal conditions. So um, we'll see what happens. We're planning for continued drought. And this is the current drought monitor um, that's prepared from by federal agencies. And um, our area continues to be categorized as a severe drought. But you can see the rest of the state is, is looking pretty dry now as well. Um, and then just to recap where we've been, um, in, back in 2014, we declared the stage two drought condition with a 20% um, reduction in demands that was required. And then a year later, in May of 2015, we went to a stage three drought emergency with 25% demand reduction. 
The following year in 20, spring of 2016, we amended that to be a 35% reduction. And then in the winter of 2017, we were forecasting some um, shortages for the summertime peak demands. We had enough water supplies that year, but we had some capacity limitations and couldn't get the water here uh, to meet peak demands. Um, so we implemented the the lawn ban to try and shave off those summer peak demands. Um, fortunately, that spring of 2017, we did receive some some help from Mother Nature, and we had some inflows to both Gibraltar and Kachuma, so we were able to um, you know, be given that our supply condition had improved, we revised the demand reduction to be 30%, and that's what it continues to be today. So just some background on our, our drought planning. This was, you know, I can't emphasize enough, it's so important to have a plan before you go into an emergency. And um, we had just updated our long-term water supply plan in 2011. So it was really the last time Kachuma was spilling was when we finished our plan. Um, and that plan showed in the long term a couple of key themes were that we would keep our uh, water demands down through strong conservation. And, and when you look at that plan, we really show our demands going down over time despite increases in population. And... Uh, it was based on the worst drought of record, which at the time was 1947 to 52. That's now the second worst drought because what we just experienced was much drier. Um, and we also had a water shortage contingency plan, which outlines the three stages of drought. We have planned demand reductions, the pl and we have um, some policies on how we achieve those planned demand reductions that are outlined in our water shortage contingency plan. And we also had a desalination reactivation as a way to address our water, water shortage. So just a summary of how we manage our supplies during droughts. We, our groundwater supplies is reserved for droughts and emergencies, so we do increase our pumping during droughts, then we let the, the basin recover and re rest through in, what's called in-lieu recharge um, during dry, uh, wet periods. And we increase our uh, imported water through the state water project. Um, when our state water allocations have been less than 100%, we've been purchasing supplemental water in order to keep the, the pipe flowing full to Kachuma. Um, and then we have planned demand reductions, and those are um, achieved through uh, rate adjustments. Um, most of our revenue is volumetric charges, and so when we have demand reductions, we need to make adjustments to our water rates. Uh, we have water use regulations as needed, um, and we enhance our public outreach. And then finally, desalination as well. So the chart on the left is, the, is from our long-term water supply plan that was done in 2011. And on the right shows what we've actually experienced over the last seven years. And so I wanted to um, just highlight a few key differences, one being that it's an additional year. Um, second, um, the amount of surface water that we've received in this drought has been much less than what was planned. We've had significant cutbacks in our supplies um, from Kachuma and Gibraltar, and that's because we really had no inflows to the lake. And as a result of having those significant cutbacks, um, we've had to experience demand reductions of 20 to 40 percent in this drought compared to the policy in our drought planning of, of up to 15% planned demand reductions. So I can't say enough about how wonderful it's been that our community has really um, helped us in managing this drought by meeting our, our demand reduction targets. Um, we've, we've had the driest consecutive seven years in recorded history, and um, you, we've had to adapt to those conditions um, although uh, how we've managed the drought is consistent with our planning policies and our long-term water supply plan. So 
So our water supply strategy currently, um, which I'll be introducing on the next slide, um, now that our original planning horizon of six years has passed, we're now planning for the next three years. So now we've got a 10-year planning period. And in our projections, we assume no additional inflows to Gibraltar or Kachuma. And we also assume that we would continue to purchase supplemental water to keep uh, our state water pipeline flowing full. Um, we also have updated the strategy based on our new groundwater projections that came out of the recent uh, report from USGS, which was a sustainable yield of our, our groundwater basins. Um, it did, the new projections do show um, additional supply to us available, assuming that we would allow seawater intrusion to occur up to the 101. That's the sort of the cutoff point. Um, our previous projections that we'd been using for our planning assumed no seawater intrusion at all. So this is our current supply strategy. The, the numbers for actual water supplies through 2018 are all, um, have been updated. So the, we're currently now in year eight of the drought and projecting for the next three years. Um, our shortage out in 2021 is about 800 and 850 acre feet. Um, we think that's a manageable amount, and so um, we're not recommending any actions to um, address that shortage right now. If a lot of conservative assumptions in, in our supply projections and things could change, so we'll wait to see what happens with this winter and reassess uh, this coming spring of 2019 where we're at. And unless there's any questions, I'll turn it over to Ms. Wood. Uh, questions on this section? No, the, the mm -hmm. only, I just have one, one little comment, just a question about the seawater intrusion and basically letting it go up to 101. And again, I'm going to report a little bit later about sea level rise. And it just made me think about the fact that we haven't talked at all about if we let seawater intrusion come up here and now sea levels rise, that sea level water intrusion is going to go further in even then. So it just, just the, oh, I'm, I, it's on. Pull it a little closer. <laughs> They're calling. Um, anyway, you got, you got my gist. It, it's really more of a comment than a question because mm -hmm. I, again, it already understood essentially trying to hold it down there at Chase Palm Park, not let it go up to the freeway. And, and I guess as a follow-up question, do we have any plans on how you combat seawater intrusion in terms of, of uh, uh, infusing water into the wall, into the into the ground. Uh, Mr. Chair, Co uh, Commissioner Davis. Yes. Um, well, let me first say uh, we've taken a conservative approach by um, by assuming some of our wells would not be operating in our in our supply projection. So we've we're not fully utilizing the the entire yield that was um, put forth in the USGS report. In terms of combating seawater intrusion and pushing it back out, um, in, historically we have just done that through in lieu recharge by not using our, our groundwater wells when, uh, when we don't need to in normal and wet circumstances. However, we have been looking at uh, a pilot project to be able to inject treated surface water into our groundwater basins to have some artificial recharge and, and um, increase uh, storage that would then push the seawater out faster. Um, we're holding off on that pilot project until Kachuma storage is up at higher levels, um, since we right now would be use, using our Kachuma storage to meet demands instead of uh, injecting in, into the ground. Great, thank you. Go ahead. Um, could you put the last slide up that shows the 2021? So in 2021, it shows the state water percentage or allocation is there a percentage of our that's a table a i assume and is that a full allocation is it a partial because we've gone down to zero in the past couple years so we're, what um percentage are you factoring in on that council member freeman uh we're assuming our table a allocation will be 35 percent going forward for the next three years 
and that we would have to buy supplemental purchases for the remaining 65% of our capacity. So the orange bar is the supplemental purchases, and the green bar is our 35% state water allocation. Okay, and so we could, um, through supplemental water purchases, we might, if we got to this point, we could actually go above where that orange is. Because um, my understanding is we're on the Central Coast Water Authority, they're working on amending the whole state water contract to allow um, agencies like ours t uh, to change how we can uh, purchase supplemental water, which will make it easier to, to get. Um, so that orange bar could go up, assuming that these changes go through? Councilmember Friedman, that's a good point. I think what will happen with those amendments is um, the amount of water that we would plan on won't change, but we wouldn't have any exchange component in those water purchases. They could be outright purchases so we wouldn't accrue any additional debt on our how much water is owed back. I think our current debt owed to AVEC is around 3,000 acre feet or so. And so we, we could pursue supplemental water without accruing any further water debt. Thank you. So I just have a couple comments too, and one's on that graph. And it's easier for me to explain to somebody who doesn't sit here once a month that that red block is really on top of the, the brown block. Because that's really what you're talking about. You're talking about the, the prior year 10,500 acre feet being reduced to 850 acre feet less. Mm -hmm. And so the additional conservation has a direct connection to that prior year's bar, right? I know we've already always done it this way, which always seems to be one of my, my comments is what the heck. But, but it's easier to explain that you're not just actually burdening me with with uh, extra conservation, but why if it's down next to that higher bar and the second one in? Does that make sense? So maybe for uh, optics, you're suggesting putting the red bar below the white bar so it's close yeah. to the green? Yep. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, just a thought. And then my other comment was on that graph uh, with the side-by-side -side reports like that with the, um, with the surface water line. That's the best graph you've ever used. Okay, yeah. in my lifetime, okay. because, because because you see these things and you go eh, whatever, and you don't you, you see the bars go up and down and you don't quite figure it out. But when you see the comparison on the past drought to this drought or whatever it was, the comparison of surface water and the huge reduction of incoming surface water and why that that gets me off the soapbox with you every month on groundwater on groundwater pumping right because then you then you can see a clear nexus on why groundwater pumping just exploded compared to the prior set of graphs it makes yeah. sense right? right so i think it's a great if you can keep that one coming that's a great great one to keep showing okay thank okay. you let's move on oh, i had a question too sorry i'm in McCure, uh your comment about the red bar i've always wanted to see it down at the bottom too um, but I had a question on the water purchases. Is that the is that the maximum we could purchase based on our pipeline capacity? Or that's correct, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilmember, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Commissioner Kilborn. Um, that's correct. It's based on the city's portion of the capacity. Um, in the past, you can see back in 2015, um, we were able to utilize other agencies. Um, portion of the pipeline capacity, because not every uh, CCWA member was uh, sending their state water uh, to Kachuma. Now that we're farther into the drought, everyone's using their capacity. So I don't think there's as much opportunity for using other, other member agencies' uh, portion of the pipe. Chair Jordan, members of the Water Commission, my name is Madeline Wood. I'm the Water Conservation Supervisor, and I'll be going through a few slides about our demand management strategy and water use regulations. Uh-oh. There we go. Compared to 2013 pre-drought water production, we had a 27% reduction in water use for the month of September. And this continues our 12-month running average reduction of 30%, which is the target that we've set for the community. In terms of our demand management strategy to meet that 30% water conservation target citywide, we have a number of water use regulations that are enforced during any year, 
And in drought years, we have additional drought water use regulations. Just to name a few, we have regulations on the time of day for watering, for large fountains, for hosing off pavement, and more. Drought water rates are also in effect, and these are based on the 30% conservation target and are currently adopted through fiscal year 2020. And we have enhanced public outreach through messaging, increased services, advertising, workshops, and more. For additional water use regulations, there may be several triggers. If the citywide demand reduction target is not met, if there are water supply interruptions or situations in which we may have enough water but conveyance capacity limitations to deliver it here. And at times, new state regulations have triggered new or modified city regulations. Currently, the State Water Resources Control Board has removed the city's 12% conservation standard and for all water suppliers statewide. So at this time, we do not foresee additional statewide drought regulations, but we continue to monitor these discussions. The phased water use regulations that we've previously discussed with Water Commission and Council include a prohibition on watering lawns. And just to note, we don't have data on how much water is specifically going to lawns in our service area, so because our meters generally um, count for all water on a property. So we had to make some assumptions, which is why you'll see a range in the estimated water savings on this slide. So the estimated savings of a lawn watering ban are 500 to 1,100 acre feet per year, prohibiting outdoor water use, except for hand watering of trees and shrubs. The rough estimate of savings for that is 1,200 to 1,600 acre feet per year, and a total prohibition on outdoor water use has a rough estimate of 1,600 to 2,000 acre feet per year. And before I turn it over to Ms. Brook, I wanted to mention uh, that we do have water conservation requirements for the development projects that come through the city. In terms of indoor water use, the city adopted and enforces the minimum indoor uh, water use requirements of the California Green Building Standards Code, and this code is the most efficient in the nation. And the city also has landscape design standards for irrigation and landscaping, which are more restrictive than the state standards. And now I'll turn it over to Ms. Brooke. Thank you, commissioners. I'm happy to be here to um, help in this presentation. And as you're hearing from your staff, from the water resources staff, as we continue into a prolonged drought, it's fair to ask the question about how much um, does new development demand um, from our water supply each year. And we had um, several presentations and with the city council and discussions with the planning commission back in 2015 and 2016, as well as your commission on the same topic. And at that time, um, City Council did not implement any restrictions on new development due to the small amount of overall water demand that new development requires. And you'll be hearing the same from me again today. I'll give you some updated statistics on that. So um, we, uh, when the city updated our general plan in 2011, with that we had a program EIR that went um, with that and analyze the environmental impacts of the projected growth over 20 year period that the general plan covers. So this first column you see here, um, water use from new development estimated per that plan Santa Barbara EIR was with all the new development that we projected over the 20 year period, we estimated that it would add for 40 acre feet per year. Um, and that represents under our current drought water supply amount would be 0.38% of overall water demand. What we've seen over the last 14 years is, is actually less water demand than is projected in the EIR. We've averaged about 26 acre feet per year of new water demand as a result of new development, which is 0.24% of the overall demand under current um, water supply assumptions. And then these next few slides break down um, in a little bit more of a, a micro scale um, estimated water demand from development. This current slide shows development under construction and um, 
goes by, it divides it by land use with a total of 94 acre feet per year for all new development under construction. And it's important to know that not all of that comes online at once. Construction projects take, can take a prolonged period of time. Um, so we wouldn't expect this all to come on in the next year. It's probably over the next couple years that we would see this come on. And then estimated potential water demand from all development in the pipeline is what we call it. But it's projects that um, are either approved through a land use discretionary process or might even have a building permit but aren't yet under construction. That's estimated about 97 acre feet per year. And then pending projects are not yet approved. They could range from somebody who just submitted an application yesterday to um, Project, some of these projects that are represented in the pending line have been in our system since even before 2007, but they've been able to maintain their uh, life through um, extensions of the Tentative Subdivision Map Act and other various reasons that they're still counted in our pending category. And we, over the last well, at least 20 years or so, we tend to find that only about a third of the projects that are pending actually become realized and on the ground and constructed. So I just want to add those caveats because even though these are small numbers relative to the overall water demand, these are in some cases a worst case scenario for the near term future, at least what we would expect for new development to come online and the water demands they would have. And with those total would be approximately 214 acre feet per year. And again, this would be metered out over several years as they go through the process to get permits and under construction. And then just to keep in perspective, uh, we've been keeping a running average of all uh, new development and the water demand that it has put brought online each year since at least 2004. Our 14 year average is, as I mentioned earlier, 26 acre feet per year. I will note that so far this year, from January to August, we have put online um, development that has demanded 38 acre feet per year. So this year already is proving to um, require more demand than the last three previous years, but still when averaged over time is in line with um, generally what we would expect um, and still would fall below our assumptions in the general plan EIR for overall growth. Qu question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Renee, uh, you, 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 you keep saying 14, 26 acre feet a year. That's the average. So you're really talking 26 acre feet a year per year. Yes. Just, just to clarify, because it's correct. it is cumulative. You're right, yeah. correct. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Could I prompt you, Renee, for, uh, to chat on a couple? Well, I just heard you say one, and I just want to reinforce, have you reinforce that a little bit because it's also in, a, it's in the report later today for Planning Commission and next week. But despite the perceived explosion, let's say, of AUD and now ADU um, projects, even with that, when you, um, when you, there's actually a reduction this year over last year in development, but when you uh, look at those and projecting out for the lifetime of the general plan, we're still actually running at less development units than we predicted in the general plan, correct? That is correct. Okay. And I can give you specifics if you want to know, but yes. <laughs> but you're, somebody you're else can. And then, <laughs> okay, so let's come back to that. And then, and then the other thing I'd like you to hear you talk about a little bit about, because everybody always focuses on the numbers and not the social or community impacts. And so maybe if you could talk a little bit after you answer that question for uh, Dave on, um, uh, on what, those, uh, what those potential impacts are to uh, replacement of old buildings not being replaced, to uh, housing being provided, and economic stimulation that would go away versus the pretty small number of uh, acre feet usage. Okay? Thanks. Certainly. So um, thank you, Chair Jordan. Um, in terms of specifics and the numbers, our general plan assumed over the life of the 20-year, um, its 20-year life, that we would potentially um, see 140 new 
residential units per year, and we've seen an average that is closer to 98 units per year. So we are producing less housing on average over the life of the general plan so far, um, less than we expected. Now, granted, we have years where there are peaks and we have more production, but it's very cyclical. And so we, we like to look at averages over longer periods of time because we know that there's also down periods too. So um, we are producing less units. And we did have a peak last year. We did. Right, but we're already below average again this year, correct? Right. Okay. Thank you. And the reason I, I was interested, because we're going to be looking at the long-term water supply plan, and we the, the general plan is now over a decade old, I think, 205 plus or minus. Um, if this is the new normal in terms of water supply, basically whether we needed to revisit the projected general plan projections mm -hmm. on housing units and, and water demand when we get to the long-term water supply plan. So, again, I'm, I'm sure you guys at the Planning Commission will be addressing that. But uh, that, that's why I thought would be interested to hear the actual numbers. So thank you. Well, and on that, I will say um, you mentioned accessory dwelling units and AUD units. It's interesting in the last year, really, the accessory dwelling units have have added uh, much more to our unit count as AUDs have sort of stagnated. Yeah. So it's just a different type of housing unit we've seen come online in the last year. And I think that would, would continue going forward to at least – um, through 2018 and probably into early 2019. And then if you just share a few thoughts, because I know when this goes to council, this is exactly what they consider. They don't just look at the numbers. They also consider the community impacts on, on social stuff like housing and economic stimulation and lack of housing and, and that kind of stuff. So maybe you could just share a little bit how it's not right. just looking at numbers and adding 42 acre feet on a piece of paper per year. That's true, and thank you. And, and you covered really the highlights of of what we've discussed with council in the past. Um, not only would we not recommend development restrictions, because specifically due to the low percentage of water demand that it actually requires, but I can only speak anecdotally because I don't have um, hard statistics in front of me. But we are working on trying to trying to nail that down a little bit more, the economic impacts of, of stalling development or uh, putting restrictions on development. But certainly um, our general plan and our housing element is full of policies of encouraging additional housing development. And so if we were in a position where we needed to make tough decisions about development restrictions, I think we'd have to get into specifics about is it housing, is it non-residential, is it affordable housing? And, and, but, I don't, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, and I hope to be have some more um, quantified information to be able to discuss at the time that this goes to City Council about other impacts that development restrictions could have. Other questions? Mr. Friedman. I just want to appreciate you raising that question about what we consider at the Council as the whole big picture. I hope I wasn't speaking incorrectly. <laughs> uh, you're not. You okay. You're fine. It's actually what we consider. The, uh, I just wanted to add another layer of complexity to this when we talk about uh, development is that the state has decided that due to the affordable housing crisis throughout the state, they are bringing a lot of new regulations that basically take away a lot of local control. So we have to plan for trying to maintain as much local control within our purview so that the state doesn't just come in and do a cookie cutter approach. So that's the other balance that we're trying to achieve because I know there's a lot of people out there that are asking, well, why don't you just stop development now because we're in this drought? Well, it's not that easy because the state is doing a lot of different bills. Uh, it's constantly changing that we have to consider as well. So um, to your point, Mr. Jordan, it, it is a big comprehensive approach that we're taking for, um, for those types of reasons. Go ahead. Um, thank you for coming and presenting. Just a couple language things. Um, you know, as the Water Commission, we don't decide on community development policies, which is appropriate. Um, but I did hear both in your presentation and in the written report, um, it talks about a worst case scenario of building out to the general plan. And it's my understanding the general plan really has approved appropriate and necessary growth. So it's, you know, if I'm the person who can't live in Santa Barbara because I don't have a house, or if I'm the person trying to build a business and can't get a permit, that's not a worst case scenario for me. Mm -hmm. So I would just suggest maybe changing that to maximum or mm -hmm. something a little less, um, sure. yeah, 
and then the other one is actually for the water staff several times um, I guess it's also in the um, development part we talk about a normal water year <laughs> as using 14,600 acre okay. feet per year um, it's both in the council agenda report for the stage three update as well as the analysis of water use development it actually starts with that in a normal water year um, I don't I think we should change that that's actually um, I don't think we're in a, a water year. I don't think we live in a world anymore where we can use almost 15,000 acre feet of water, even if it rains. Um, we've got the biological opinion coming up. Um, you know, there's just so many uncertainties, and even if we get a good water year, we might automatically go into another drought year, and we shouldn't be using 15,000 acre feet when we know very well that our community can, can sustain itself on so much less. So um, I don't know if we want to call it a historical average or a pre-drought average, mm -hmm. but I don't think we should call it um, normal anymore. I think the pre-drought is uh, probably the most appropriate term for it. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So uh, presumably the new development uh, incorporates all the water conservation measures, both indoors and outdoors. Do you track uh, to some extent what, you know, from the metering and all that, whether that uh, results in a significant difference between traditional you know, or, you know, the historical use per capita versus what you have in those new developments? It is in a way, but doesn't tell us per capita comparative to the to the other ones. Just to see, I think it would be good messaging eventually if, if there's a significant difference. So that that's another argument to talk about. Um, Commissioner Keller, I'm not sure that we've done that. We could, um, but just to clarify, the numbers I'm that I've presented are our estimated water demand from new development. We use water demand factors based on the uh, number of units, type of. So that's. Um, but it's net new, so it does take into account what was on the site before and then um, what was being developed. But it's, it's, it's gross, you know, it, and it takes into account all the, all the projects for the year. Right. No, no my point was, and I, I get it, uh, that this is estimated, and it's great to have that estimate. It would be good to see actual, given that now they've been built, you know, you have a record of how many mm -hmm. have been built, whether that conservation measures are really working and, and so right, right. better than the other ones, huh? the traditional <laughs> And, and that's a great point you bring up because it's often surprising to the public how little water use new development does demand, but it's in large part because new plumbing fixtures, landscape conservation standards, all that changing over with the redevelopment really keeps the water use pr pretty low. And Commissioner Keller, just one more point. If I'm not mistaken, the water demand factor is um, for full occupancy, and often it takes many years for these projects to have full occupancy. So I think what we would see, at least for the first initial years of a meter, would be trending lower than what was estimated. But we can definitely dig into that. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Renee. Is there anything else on this item? All right. We'll move on. Thank you all. Um, the introduction to wastewater rate development. Mr. Arroyo. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, just wanted to recap and also introduce our next speaker here. So the last time we went through a comprehensive 10-year financial plan was in 2014. And uh, a lot has changed. Uh, certainly the drought has had an, a big impact on our, water, our wastewater rates, um, along with recently completing our El Estero master plan, kind of laying out where we need to go for the next 30 years. And so the rate study that uh, we have embarked in, embarked on, we, we talked with Council or Water Commission, I think in June, and we appointed a ad hoc committee, which uh, includes uh, Chair Jordan and Commissioner Kilborn. Um, so that's on our, our wastewater rates um, ad hoc committee. Uh, we came to the commission in July of 2018. Um, I'm sorry, went to the council in July 2018 to authorize a contract with HDR. And uh, Mr. Korn here is going to give us a presentation on basically the basics behind wastewater rates, uh, the fundamentals there, and then some of the policy issues that we're going to need to tackle. Um, it is our, our plan to meet with the ad hoc group but then bring this item back to the Water Commission probably in December to really get some, some input on some significant policy issues so that we can also keep this thing on schedule and we'll go over the schedule at the end. But um, anyway, 
um, answer, ask any questions along the way, um, and we hope to kind of keep everyone awake on this one. Okay, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Chair Jordan, commissioners, appreciate the opportunity to be here. As Joshua said, I'll be walking through what I call our Rates 101. So this is kind of the basics of how we take a look at establishing wastewater rates and outlining some of the key policy issues at each kind of main stopping point of the analysis as we go through this. And so this morning I'll talk real quickly about the purpose of the study, outline some of those key goals and approaches, and then we'll really dive into the basics and the key issues and assumptions and development of the analysis to establish cost-based wastewater rates. And then I've got a, a slide on next steps, the schedule, uh, as was mentioned, when we'll be back in front of the commission working with the ad hoc committee to develop the final recommendations. So the overall purpose of this is to provide sufficient revenue to operate and maintain the city's wastewater infrastructure. So this is taking a look at the revenues that you receive from wastewater rates, making sure that that is sufficient to adequately fund the annual operation and maintenance expenses, as well as the capital improvement needs of the system. And so we're looking at both pieces of that as we go through this. And we're looking long term. We want to take a look out over a 10 year period to make sure we're capturing all the key assumptions. You just talked about water demand. As I get Get further through the presentation that also has an impact on wastewater rates and so what is that going to look like over the next five to ten year window and how does that impact the overall needs of the wastewater utility and the funding needs that are there utility rates water wastewater solid waste uh, stormwater are all guided by proposition 218 which outlines the approach to setting rates and essentially comes down to the proportional allocation of costs between customers so we want to make sure that we're not charging one customer more than another customer and so that each customer's rate or their actual bill reflects the impact that they place on the system so as we go through this process, then we're going to make sure that we abide by those requirements to develop cost-based and equitable rates. And that equitable comes back to how you charge your current customers. And that's going to be one of those policy areas that we'll talk about is are those customer classes, residential, commercial, et cetera, are those appropriate? Do they reflect your actual customer needs and their characteristics? We also want to make sure that we reflect prudent financial planning criteria. This gets into make sure that we meet your legal requirement to maintain debt service coverage ratios. So when you issue long-term debt, you sign the contract, yes, we're going to pay this back, and yes, we'll agree to maintain this level of revenue. That's a very important one. We also want to make sure, though, that you're maintaining your system at an adequate level. So as we take a look at the capital needs, are you funding those appropriately through either growth related fees as those come in the door or are you paying with rates on an annual basis to maintain the system? So I liken this to changing the oil in the car. We want to make sure that we do that. We've got to paint the house. We've got to do all those different things to keep it up. And those things should be paid on an annual basis through rates ultimately so that you're not borrowing long term to pay for those types of projects that need to be done on a daily or yearly basis. We'll also take a look at target reserve balances. Are there sufficient re reserves, cash in the bank essentially, to maintain in case there is an emergency, major capital infrastructure failure, low revenue year? How are we going to deal with that? So we'll take a look at all those with a couple others as well as we go through this. And as we establish this, there are generally accepted methodologies but we tailor those to the city system and your specific customer characteristics. That's key. We don't just take the information and say, here's what was done in city Y, we're just gonna change this. No, to meet the proportionality requirements, we really need to take a look at how your system operates, what are those cost drivers, and who's placing those costs on the system. Is it a residential customer, a multifamily customer, a commercial type customer, an industrial customer? And the way we do that, our starting point is this manual. It's the Water Environment Federation Manual Practice Number 27, uh, Financing and Charges for Wastewater Systems. So this gives us the various approaches that can be utilized to establish cost-based and equitable rates. It talks about the approach that should be used. It talks about how you can look at customer classes, how costs should be allocated or uh, distributed to the various customer types and what impacts they may place on the system. So again, that's our starting point, but then we take this back to your customer characteristics, your system costs to develop those ultimate rates. 
what that manual outlines is a three-step process. And this is where we'll have, these are the key stopping points for, for the rate studies we go through this. The first one is the revenue requirement. Then that goes into the cost of service. Then that goes into the rate design. And those are sequential. We can't start with the rate design and work our way backwards because we need to determine in the revenue requirement, what is the overall cost of the utility? How much does it take to pay for the O&M to fund the capital infrastructure and improvements? Once we know that, that gives us a transition plan. What do we need to have for revenues over the next 10 years to do what we need to do? That's one of those policy issues we'll be back in front of the commission with to talk about what that looks like. Once we know the costs, then we can allocate them to the different customer classes in that cost of service. This gets to the proportionality requirement of Proposition 218. So we look at how each customer plays on the system. What are their, what are their volumes? What are their strengths? Or how nasty is that wastewater coming down to the treatment plant? And how hard is it and expensive is that to treat as we go forward? Once we know the overall cost and the revenue requirement, that alloc proportional allocation of costs and the cost of service, then we can design rates because it, what the cost of service gives us is a unit cost. It's this amount of cost on a fixed basis for each customer. It's this amount on a volumetric component. And that's really what's going to develop the rates for the first year, which then we can use to project over the next five-year period or longer, if you so desire, as we go forward. So starting with the revenue requirement, uh, really, as I've said, it compares the revenues to the expenses. We want to make sure we meet those prudent financial planning criteria, making sure we're adequately funding renewal and replacements, meeting our debt service coverage ratio, making sure we have sufficient reserves in the bank should something happen, go bump in the middle of the night on the infrastructure side or operating side. Uh, we take a look at the long-term time period, as I've talked about, and I talk about this on a standalone basis. Ideally, wastewater rates fund all wastewater costs. So we're not taking a look at any transfer of any other funds from any other city funds or utilities. We want wastewater rates to fund wastewater costs. And so that's one of the key elements of the revenue requirement analysis. And we use what's noticed as the cash basis methodology. Simple statement is, this is just looking at the needs in each year. How do we fund those? And away we go for each individual year throughout that five to 10 year period going forward. So we're gonna take a look at the overall financial, utility financial and city financial objectives. What are some of those key financial criteria that we wanna incorporate as part of this? We wanna make sure that we follow those policies that are in place today as well as other industry best practices and, and approaches as part of that. We wanna make sure that we're adequately funding so that you have a financially sustainable utility for the long term. That's really why we're looking out over that five to 10 year period of, as part of that. And so this is just a continuation of some of the past analyses that you all have done in the past. So here's the policy discussion side of this. So as we go through this process, we have in the top left-hand corner our financial policy. So we've got our debt service coverage. That one's a legal requirement typically, if, especially if it's a municipal revenue bond, you are going to abide by that or you're in technical default of your borrowing. So that's a legal one that we have to meet as part of that. However, when we look at the analysis, we want to target for something higher than that minimum. So if our target is 1.1 times coverage, we may want to target a 1.2 or a 1.25 on all debt as part of that so that if you have a situation where revenues are low, you're not going to approach that minimum and start down the path of having issues with your repayment on the long-term debt. As we start looking at some of the other policies, ending reserve balances, use of long-term debt, renewal and replacement funding, these end up being our benchmarks. Here's what we want to achieve as a utility. These are the best practices. These meet the city's goals and objectives. And as we do that, we may not meet those in each year, and that's where we need to have that discussion of, here's our target, we're gonna get there in year five, is that sufficient for the commission and the city to, to achieve that over a long-term time period? Or do we want to look at what that needs to be to meet that goal today as we go forward? We also want to talk in the right-hand corner about our funding of annual renewal and replacement. So what is our target? How much 
reinvestment in the system do we need to make on an annual basis from a pay-as-you-go or cash basis approach where we're funding that through rates on an annual basis? Is that annual depreciation expense? That's probably the floor because that reflects the cost of infrastructure on average 30 to 50 years ago, and it costs much more to replace that infrastructure today than when it was originally put in service. Or do we look at those future replacement needs and look at what we need to do over the, over the next five to 10, year, 10 years, which is what we've been provided at this point, and fund that as we go forward? So we'll be talking about some of those key assumptions and how that may impact overall revenue needs into the future. The bottom left talks about our levels of service. This gets into the projection of future O&M, any additional programs or practices or capital infrastructure needs. So one of the key issues that's been coming up over the last several years is as you embark on new regulations, whether it's state, federal, or local, there may be costs associated with that. How does that impact the overall forecast of O&M, and how does that impact revenue levels? And is that a key driver that we need to address with the public and public outreach component of this as we move forward to explain what's driving the overall study results? And then making sure that we're using growth-related fees properly, the connection fees, that they're paying for growth projects or growth-related debt service as we go forward. So those are the key components of the revenue requirement analysis that we'll be back in front of you talking about some of these different components if there are any concerns as we move forward with it or to gain your feedback on yes let's go down this path and meet these goals and objectives in the short term and so we'll outline what those are going forward yes sir so a couple of questions one of them is you're probably looking at uh, historical revenues and expenses, and so you're working with that. Uh, and that may have, for example, maybe you're using too much energy uh, for some reason you have old equipment you need to, and with the upgrade, you probably you would lose, uh, use less. So how does that get built in? And also, you mentioned a little bit the level of service. So is that meaning, for example, if there's a, an upcoming requirement to meet a higher level of discharge, mm -hmm. that's what you're considering there? So exactly, yeah. So one of the things we'll do with staff, and we'll really actually get close to doing this piece of it, is we're going to look at that projection of the O&M and capital over the next five to ten years. And we're, that's the question we ask is, okay, are we projecting correctly off historical costs? Or were those costs higher than they should be or lower than they are going to be? And look at any adjustments that need to be made on a year-by-year -year basis. And then on top of that, build in, okay, what's coming down the pipeline here for new treatment requirements or a cost of treatment? Where do we build those in? When are those going to hit? You know, all of those pieces we'll try and capture as part of this to the best that we can. In in terms of the five to ten five to ten year that you're you're planning out, some of the large capital projects that we have are going to be beyond that that frame, and they're going to be some of the more expensive ones. So, how do you account that if we just plan five to ten years out, but it would take us more than five to ten years to build up those reserves? that are, say, 25 years out, uh, how do you account for that within the 5- to 10-year time frame? So we can start to build that into that. Um, so the, the analysis or the technical model is Excel. So if we need to pull out longer, we can do that to look at that. I mean, it's dragging cells across. Uh, fairly straightforward. The challenge once you get out past 10 years is how closely are we going to reflect reality? Now, the project cost we may have a good handle on. But what are the O&M expenses 12, 15 years out there? That's where it challenges. So we can take a look at that and build that in. Or if we know the project cost and we can build that into the revenue requirement on, you know, here's what we're adjusting rates and we can pull out a certain amount of money each year to start pre-funding, we can go down that path as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Friedman, um, part of the – El Estero master plan was looking exactly at that, which is how do we spread out, in particular recognizing that we're going to have a certain level of debt service going on, hopefully through the SRF program, but how do we kind of sustain that if it's, say, for example, $5 million a year, so once we pay something off, it falls off, we go ahead and do something else. And so we spent quite a bit of time kind of spreading that out so that we had kind of a, a plan at least. Certainly there may be something that comes up that requires us to accelerate that. But the whole idea was to try to have this smoothing out so that we ultimately will get our rates up to a sustainable level. And when we're really talking about is inflationary increases and not significant increases going forward. And so that's what we're going to try and accomplish here with this 10-year 10, 10 rate study. 
All right, I will keep rolling if there are no other questions on the revenue requirement. So once we know the overall cost, then we can allocate that between the different customer classes. And the first question is, what, what is this cost of service? What are you doing? Well, it's a method to equitably allocate the revenue requirement, your costs, to each of the customer classes. And the challenge is, no utility tracks costs by customer class. Well, today we worked on a residential pipeline, and tomorrow we'll work on a commercial or Today we're only going to treat waste, uh, wastewater from the residential customers. No, it all comes down the pipe and it gets there. So we need to have an approach to take a look at how do we allocate these costs. What costs benefit each customer type? Because each customer type has a different characteristics or demand that drive the costs on the system. So that WEF manual practice number 27 outlines here's the cost that typical utilities incur, and this is where we come back to look at how you incur costs and your customer base to say here's what's driving that. On the wastewater side, it's generally overall volumes, so how much wastewater is coming down to the plant, how does it get there from point A to point B, what it costs to treat it, and that what it costs to treat piece is based on the strength or how nasty that wastewater is. So residential wastewater can be in many cases and most of the time a lower strength than a commercial customer because there's more things coming down the pipeline that need to be treated at the treatment plant to meet your discharge permit. And so that's what we're looking at. What are those costs? You know, additional energy when you have higher strengths because it takes longer to treat to take all those constituents out. And so that's what we'll be looking at as we go through this and then proportionally allocating them. So this is generally accepted as fair and equitable. I don't use, you won't hear me use the word fair very often because we can all get the same wastewater bill and we may not all think that's fair. So we come back to equitable and cost-based generally. And really, this is our proportionality requirement of Proposition 218. So when we come down to the bottom of the cost of service, it gives us two pieces of information that are useful in developing uh, rates going forward. It tells us what the cost to serve each customer class is. So are we undercharging or overcharging one subset of the city's customers? And it gives us those unit costs, as I talked about, to show what it costs on a fixed basis or on a variable basis for volume as part of that. And so we go through this process where we take the total cost and the revenue requirement and we take a look at how it's split between volume, strength, and customer. Within the strength, there's various constituents, uh, maybe biochemical oxygen demand or BOD, total suspended solids, TSS, nitrogen, phosphorus, all the nutrient removal component, those are different based on your different customer classes. And so we take a look at each customer class's proportional share of each of those components. So we'll take a look at your treatment process. What proportion of that treatment process is needed for volume needs versus strength needs? And then what costs go along with that and allocate that to the customer classes to come back to the overall costs or revenue needs from each of the different customer classes. This is generic slide. We have residential, multifamily, non-residential. Uh, for the study, we're looking at your customer classes of service, your rate schedules, and that's one of the key policy decisions that we have on this is coming back and looking at who are those customers. Are those the appropriate customer classes or rate schedules because those customers all impact the system in a like manner. And so as we go through this, we'll look at each customer class's facility requirements and overall costs as part of that. So when we get to the policy discussion, that's what we'll be looking at. So right now, as an example, you have a commercial rate structure that's commercial one, commercial two, commercial three, commercial four. Commercial one through three are all charged the same rate. So their bill is based on the same. Each individual customer obviously has their own characteristics. But that rate structure itself is all the same. So that's part of this discussion is to look at that and say, are those appropriate or is that appropriate? Or do we need to separate these out and have a different class for different users of how they impact the system? So that's the step we're at right now. Yes, sir. How far is the... The higher First strength class. industrial, correct. So what's an example of that in the uh, city? Restaurants okay. are one example of those. Uh, essentially anything with food preparation okay. or discharge type program. Right. Um, you know, I'm thinking Mission Linen. Is that rise to that class? You know, I'd have to look at that specifically. We're not really a big industrial city. So correct. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. And that's part of what we're just starting to do right now is look at 
who are what's the details behind those customer classes and does it make sense that the linen is in that class or should it be over here in this class? and so in that in that in that case when you're trying to separate those those classes or quantify do you actually go out on site and measure their discharges or, or they're just industry assumptions? Correct, industry assumptions. Okay. So there is some data out there. We're not necessarily worried about the volume side of that. In m almost all cases, we have water volumes that we can use as a surrogate. That's the best we can because we don't put a meter on everybody's wastewater pipe, right? Um, it's the strength piece, and that's where we fall back to industry standards. Say, okay, this is the type of uh, business this is. Here's the typical strength. Um, it used to be that folks measured that more frequently. Now it's typically only on the high strength side where that is measured. So, so, so uh, we, we're not very industrial, but uh, do we have some customers, industrial customers, where we actually push the requirement to them to do the pretreatment so that it doesn't come to us? And, and how is that handled in here? Yes, so the way it's handled in the cost of service is that we'll come down at the end and say, here's the cost per pound for BOD or whatever the constituent is that we want to look at. And if you're over a certain threshold, then you're, and it doesn't have to be per pound, it can be per 100 cubic feet, per 1,000 gallons, however we want to determine that, to show here's what it costs over this threshold. So if you're continually over this threshold, it's an additional charge on top of that. That's one way to approach that. The other way is to build it into the rate and have a separate rate structure or class for those customers where we allocate costs on that higher strength level. And then their rate would be higher than everybody else to reflect that. So there's a couple, and that's part of what we're looking at as well as the cost of service because what we need to do to meet the proportionality requirement is we need to allocate the cost to those customer classes. So that's gonna be one of the first assumptions or key policy areas is looking at those customer rate structures and saying, is this what we wanna use? If it's yes, fine, we'll go down that path and see if there's any differences, interclass differences between the customers. If we wanna change the customer classes, we wanna do that up front so that when we get to the end, we know what it costs to serve that type of customer going forward. And then at the end of this, it's are there any interclass differences? Are we outside of, of the range of reasonableness of the results of the cost of service? And again, this is a snapshot in a point of time. It's looking at one year of cost for the cost of service, one year of customer characteristics, so it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to, even if the best result where everybody has the same rate adjustment, that can change next year as your customer characteristics change going forward. So once we know that overall cost of service, unless there's any qu other questions on cost of service, all right, we'll, we can design rates. And so we typically come back to talk about what are our goals and objectives. These are example of a handful of the goals and objectives, revenue sufficiency and stability. So we wanna make sure we have enough revenue to pay the bills, to operate the utility, to fund the capital but we also want our rates to be stable. We don't want them going up and down and up and down uh, as we go forward. We wanna make sure that the city can explain them and the customer can understand them. What you have today is great. So people can understand how they're billed. We wanna make sure that we don't make something so complex that the customer doesn't understand how their bill's calculated. And then the customer service folks can't even explain it. And you may be surprised at what you can find out there when you see some rate structures. So we wanna make sure that we keep it simple. Uh, we need to think about affordability. How does this impact all of your various customers across the income ranges and what does that do? And so when we get to the end of this, as we look at rates, we wanna look at what it means to a customer that is a low user, a medium user, a high user. How does that impact their overall monthly bill based on your, your customer basis? And then we wanna be legally defendable and equitable, obviously meet the legal requirements that we have going forward. So when we go through this, we'll take a look at the revenue requirement and cost of service. We wanna incorporate any goals and objectives that you all may have or the city may have as a whole for the rate designs and then develop those rates that are cost-based and equitable to generate those revenues over this next future period. I always like to hit a little bit of our rate structure terms. So I've already said all these probably and haven't explained them. So structure versus level. Structure is how you charge your customer. 
level is how much revenue you receive through that structure based on your customer characteristics. So that revenue requirement will tell us what the level of revenue is needed. The rate design then determines what that structure is. How are we going to charge the customers? Are we going to maintain what you have in place today? We also have fixed and variable charges. So our fixed charges are not based on usage. That's the minimum you pay each month to have wastewater service can vary and often does vary by meter size and it can include I call multiple fixed charges so there's some utilities that look at a readiness to serve charge a fixed component a customer component which you have in place today is great um, but there's other ways of folks look at it and part of the cost of service will look at what costs do we need to build into that fixed charge and then there's the variable charge based on volume or flow and commonly referred to in HCF, 100 cubic feet. Each 100 cubic foot is 748 gallons uh, or 1,000 gallons uh, for whatever that measurement is going forward. Now, what's interesting is when we take a look at our cost structure for the utility, it's primarily fixed, especially in the short term. So if everybody somehow plugged up their wastewater pipe or shut off their water, your cost would not change significantly in the short term. And when you look at utilities, typically 80 to 95% of costs are fixed in that time frame. And on the wastewater side, they're pushing closer to the 90, 95 side just because of the variable component. Electricity, that's a big one obviously at the treatment plan as part of that. The variable piece is that component that is the other 5 to 20%. Utility rates are the inverse of this. We're always on our lower fixed charge, a higher volume charge, especially on the water side because we're picking that all up. Now that's been changing over the last 10 years because of droughts and philosophies changing, but that's de typically where we're at. Just as a point of reference, you're at about a 50-50 split between fixed revenue and variable revenue for the wastewater utility. So not a bad spot to be from a, ra a rate stability standpoint as part of that uh, as we go forward. So some of the key industry trends, declining consumption, the, the water decline, the drought re mandated or required reductions, that all drives wastewater because there's a portion of your wastewater bill that's based on that. And it also has an impact on the loadings. So less water, higher strengths at the plant, more cost costly to treat. Uh, there's pressure to move towards volumetric charges. Three or four years ago, there was a big push to move all residential customers to a volumetric rate for wastewater in California. Uh, that sort of has slowed down, um, but now we've come back because of the drought to this revenue stability goal where maybe we don't want to go that far. And that's where you're sitting at a, a very good spot with the 50-50. We want to take a look at the customer classes. Make sure we reflect those various strength customers. And we're also getting into a lot of discussion of the different impacts between a tiny home or a very large home. I'm dealing with this in a lot of areas right now where they're trying to figure out how do we charge because we've got a 600 square foot home being built or we've got a 7,000 square foot home being built. How do we deal with this going forward as part of that? And then we want to always consider our customer bill impacts and affordability. So that's where we come back to that rate design and look at that overall bill impact at the end of this to say, here's what a customer changes. If they use on average 8 HCF or 15 HCF, what's the impact to that monthly bill today and going forward? What's unique is when you look at the California State Water Resource Control Board, this is their 1617 wastewater user charge survey report. The top left is the residential rate structure, so how they're charging customers. 75% of the utilities in that survey had a fixed flat rate. So it was the same amount every month, 12 months out of the year, regardless of what the usage was. Only 25% of the customers had a fixed or variable component within your rate. That's you up there in that upper left corner where you're on that side of it. So you do have that volumetric component built into yours. On the commercial side, uh, the majority have some level of variable component built into their rate. Uh, about 57% have that component in there. Uh, whereas only 43% have a flat rate. So again, you're where you need to be, I think, from a volumetric component. The question is, how does that reflect your usage characteristics today uh, as we start going through this? Because when we look at the, your current rates, 
This is for a single detached dwelling unit. They have the base charge of $19.63 plus $3.41 per 100 cubic feet HCF for the first 10. It's capped at 10. Since the drought, your average use is now down to about 8.5 hundred cubic feet. So if you go back several years, people were hitting that cap each month because they were using more than 10 HCF. So that has actually reduced the revenues that you've seen on the wastewater side as well as people have started moving below that cap and not hitting that maximum bill. So on average right now, a customer pays, you know, 50 some dollars, 52, 53 dollars a month if they hit the cap and then slightly less than that as they come down. So at eight and a half, they're just below that $50 mark on a monthly basis for wastewater. So that has an impact on that. So looking out over the five to 10 year period, we need to think about what that consumption may do going forward. Same charge for your one to four dwelling units, but it's capped at eight. And on the five plus dwelling units, it's capped at seven. This is typical approach. When you start looking at larger complexes, the average use per unit does decline. So we've seen that in a lot of the studies that we've worked on. You start looking at the bigger complexes, they're smaller units, they typically have uh, separate irrigation meters, so that's not built into their indoor usage. And so these are the components that we'll also be looking at to meet those requirements of Prop 218 is, does the 10, the eight, the seven cap, does that make sense going forward? Is that where we need to be based on the city's goals? On the commercial side, here's the combined rate for the class one through three. It's a volume charge per 100 cubic feet of $3.87 and a base charge. So it's the greater of either if you're a 5 eighths inch meter customer, $36.90 or essentially 10 HCF. So if you use 10, you're over that minimum. If you're under it, you pay that minimum based on your meter size as part of that. So again, the drought has had an impact on the commercial side, maybe not as significant as on the residential side, but that can drive some of those revenues. Here's our class four, the restaurants, those others as we talked about, the higher strength customers. They have a slightly higher volume charge per 100 cubic feet of $4.70, and then that same meter charge and the greater of the actual use of that going forward. So as we go through this rate design, what we're gonna try and do is take a look at what are those goals and objectives? What best meets the city's approach going forward? We're gonna dig into those customer classes, specifically on the commercial side to make sure that that looks reasonable. Does that reflect how each of those customer classes utilizes the system? And is there any need to look at that fixed and volumetric charge? That 50-50 split is pretty reasonable in my mind, uh, but do we wanna move that one way or the other as you go forward? So the last piece of this is connection fees. We're providing a cursory review, essentially, of the connection fee for wastewater. You just updated this a few years ago. We're just taking a look to make sure that the overall approach and methodology is correct. It follows generally accepted guidelines. And we wanna make sure that that follows your goals and objectives for growth paying for growth. Those, those new customers, that new development pays for the impact that they place on the system and shelters existing customers from those impacts. And really it reimburses the customers for the value of that capacity, what's available today, because they've been paying for that for the last five to umpteen years on the existing system and provides that equity. This allows those customers to pay the same rates because they're buying into the system based on the value of that capacity. And I think it's important to note that capacity is not just volume or flow. It really gets down to our uh, nutrient removal and demands on the wastewater system and specifically at the treatment plant. So we may have lots of room at the treatment plant to take a whole lot more volume, but the process is slowed down by the higher strength. And so we're gonna be looking through, these are just the examples I threw up earlier. Uh, these constituents, we're talking with folks to make sure there's nothing else we think we need to include on here to actually have a, a good allocation of costs to the various customer classes of service. So next steps, uh, I'm actually gonna jump to here. Uh, schedule basically does the same thing. Uh, the right in the middle is the rate study. 
Uh, you'll see the blue bar going from September to April time frame. That's really the technical analysis, and the red boxes are really our internal meetings with staff to go through everything. And then we've got the green triangles in the bottom two. And so we've got policy input in December and February. We're, and then we have the public presentations back in front of the commission, the city council, uh, on those public presentations in the October, that's us today. And then we've got those presentations out in March, April, and June. So March would be those, here's our preliminary recommendations. Uh, make sure we have no issues, concerns. Then we'll be back in April to present our final study recommendations. Uh, if the council and commission approve, we would move forward with that. Uh, say that the other way, commission and council approve how we are moving forward to issue that public notice. And then in June, have that public hearing uh, to adopt rates if everything moves as planned based on where we're sitting today. And with that, I'll take any other questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. I was, um, uh, I ran by the last item without uh, calling for public comment and I didn't see any speaker slips, but I want to make sure if anybody has any public comment for this item, if they want to uh, hustle over and get a speaker slip. And I don't see anybody, so we'll go to uh, questions. Really? <laughs> so uh, the wastewater uh, plant has other revenues. Uh, it, it sells recycled water. Mm -hmm. uh, it can sell biosolids. Are those taken into consideration, or are those kind of different business units and kept separate from this rate structure? So I'll take a stab at that. Um, they are separate business units. Recycled water is wholly a water costs, yeah. Um, it obviously uses wastewater staff mm -hmm. that are compensated by water customers for that service. Okay, so, so that's, that's separate from the rate that structure. That is separate, yeah. Um, let's see, other revenue. We do charge uh, a very small fee for fats, oils, and grease that are disposed of at the facility. It doesn't am amount to a significant amount. Uh, and then there are fees for our... Um, industrial users mm -hmm. <coughs> to mm -hmm. discharge and so there are permits typically associated with those mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to be tackling all that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the so other quick question was just uh, in the list of uh, things to consider in terms of strength you didn't have pathogens and i imagine at some point there may be a need for disinfection at the out uh, and at the end yeah, that's a little bit out of my, I'm the rate geek guy, but yeah, yes, okay. Okay. Uh, that that is coming. There's lots of discussion about that, but yeah, that would be something that could be baked into this if that were a cost we see coming up in the future. So we currently have a requirement to disinfect before we discharge, we disinfect and then we remove the chlorine before it goes out to the ocean, but um, certainly there may be changes in, in the future to increase that, but uh, at this point, we don't see going beyond the chlorine. Mm -hmm. It's just a policy sensitivity on the, the cap. Um, so, you know, it's been explained to me that we don't think people use, you know, anything over 10 HCF. People are you, probably doing outdoor mm -hmm. water use. Um, so I just, I'm sensitive to that. I'd like more information when you come back to us on that. And then you said something that I thought was really interesting when you talked about multifamily homes who often have separate irrigation meters. So I don't see why we would have a cap if they have a separate irrigation meter because that would mean that they have a separate irrigation meter, so we should be making sure that all of that water is accounted for in the, the wastewater fees if they already have a separate irrigation meter. I would agree with that statement, yes. I'll put that down as a note as well. Is it, um, is it safe to characterize this process up until that slide where you talked about uh, affordability and rate variability as that somebody gets locked in a closet to work on numbers? <laughs> and you develop those based on industry standards. And then when it gets to that point, Joshua says, oh, my God, we can't replace 100% of our 50-year-old pipe in, in, on, and, on, at one time on a rate increase. Is that where the, the, the gray area starts to come in in your work? Do you initially put it together as if you were going to uh, take care of everything, so to speak? So yes, so there's two two parts to that. So we'll be coming back to you next month with uh, the CIP, and then I'll look at the next five to six years of planning that we have. But he'll also be taking into consideration the long range. But that's what that's what his analysis will look at. And certainly there will be. Um, I'm hoping there isn't any crazy shock. We've been trying to keep up with those costs, and certainly we've had some changes out on what we're planning to do. But um, I'm hoping there isn't a 
too crazy of a shock. I mean, we have been and we had anticipated pretty much 5 to 6% increases going forward just to keep up with the level of capital that we were anticipating. But there could come that, that day of reckoning where we say, you know what, we're just at that point where we, we don't feel like we can raise wastewater rates anymore. And that's where we're going to have to – we'd have to come back and look at our CIP and say, what are we not going to do? Okay. Yeah. But you do see data that says it could be justified to chase those rate increases in somewhere else out in the world of maintenance or, or capital uh, improvements. But it just when it gets to time when it's a policy or political decision and, and what the community will bear, that's when you have that discussion, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. And, and what we'll try and do is outline what those drivers are. You know, what is it the capital? Is it a change in process? You know, wh whatever it may be, then we can come back to you all and say, he here's what we really see as driving this. And if it's kind of that gray area, you know, what, what direction would you like us to take on that? Okay. And then uh, I just have a quick comment, too. So, you know, the only thing that matters at the end of this process, right, to a customer is that their rate's going up, okay? And already... I'm going to be at a loss to have a really good explanation of all the uh, all the nuts and bolts that went into yeah. that. And it, it seems to me to be real clear as we go through this process. We we really need to work on clear talking points that break down this and the rest of the process into something that makes sense to the public because inherently they just don't understand I'm using less and you're charging me more. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Mr. Chair, thank you for bringing that up. In fact, at 11 o'clock today, since we have our rate consultant in town, we we'll have our our uh, outreach consultant also meeting with us to work start immediately working on that because that is an important part of it. We need to people need to understand what they are paying for. In this and I think you guys have been very clear to us about what you're looking for on that so we're going to be working on that there is a uh, ad hoc committee we'll be working through as well to kind of bring something back to to make sure that when we do come down and hopefully it isn't a significant rate increase but when we do come down to whatever it is it's it will be clear to the community why it is needed good okay nothing else from anybody oh gosh okay you're off the hook Thank you. Appreciate the time. You also uh, work on um, the same process for uh, water supply. I do water rates. Yeah. For, so for, so yep. coming down out of Cater, be interesting next time you're in town. Sometime I'd love to hear if you're at one of our ad, our <laughs> subcommittee meetings or something, just to hear about uh, hear your your talk on historical development of the tier system for HCFs, mm. because again, like Megan said on the on the other end of it. I'm in a household with children, but essentially six adults and a grandchild. Mm. And so it's pretty difficult. For, it's, it's hard work to stay under 10, okay? <laughs> but so, which we, we try to, but, it, but, but we're being penalized for the size of our household, not for the water use, because mm. we're probably all using, we could be all using less water per person than a household of four, mm -hmm. but we're being penalized in the rates. And it's, not, it's always, and this isn't just me, people ask me this all the time, in a, in a large single family house, how did we get here and how did that happen and, and why does it work that way? And I just go, I don't know. But, yeah. so. <laughs> Absolutely, we but, can do that. Okay, <laughs> thanks. All right, thank you very much. And we'll move on to our next item, which is a pilot study for the AMI. All right, Mr. Chair, thank you. We've got a, a collection of staff here today to talk, um, but do want to be sensitive to the time. So we got uh, uh, wanted to leave about ten minutes at the end, so we need to wrap up by by uh, ten fifty. Does that sound right? Somewhere in there. Right. So, okay. Well, good, good morning, Chair Jordan and Commissioners and Councilmember Friedman. I am Kathy Taylor, the Water System Manager for the City. And it's my pleasure to have my staff here, Matt Ward. He's the Water Distribution Superintendent. And with him is Teresa Lancey. She's our uh, Water Resources uh, Supervisor over metering. And they are going to present the uh, AMI pilot project that is about to get underway. So with that, I will hand it over to Mr. Ward. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I am Matt Ward. I'm the Water Distribution Superintendent. I'm happy to be here. Um, we we're fortunate to also have Teresa Lancy here this morning, who is the water distribution supervisor um, who oversees meter reading. She's also been instrumental in being able to uh, oversee our asset management work in water distribution. And that's been a big help in looking at the full breadth of what metering means to water distribution. And um, 
Today, she's going to talk a little bit about our water metering program and then also focus a little bit more on the water dish or the, the advanced metering infrastructure AMI pilot that we're currently developing. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Teresa. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Jordan, Commissioners. Uh, I'm also excited to be here. It's been a bit of a long road to get to this day of uh, talking to you about an AMI pilot project. So uh, we wanted to give you a little bit of a review of our metering program and our AMI discussion timeline to give you some context on how we got to where we are today. And then we wanted to also provide you some overview of the AMI technology and the components that are involved and also some of the benefits that we pr foresee. Uh, then we'll be talking about our current efforts, the pilot study, and our next steps. So the water metering program, everyone probably thinks it's, it's just a water meter, but there's actually a lot to running the program overall. Uh, obviously, there's the reading of the meters itself. Uh, there's a customer service aspect. There's installation and maintenance. Uh, in addition, there's a data processing, taking in all the reads, processing the reads, getting them ready for billing. And then there's also procur procurement, which is not just purchasing items, but it's also doing the research and finding out what sort of technologies are available, what is the best fit for our overall metering program. Uh, in addition to our metering program, we've been developing our overall asset management program for the water distribution section. On the left, you'll see a screenshot of our work order management system, and this is for our entire water distribution system, including our water meters. And we're going to be utilizing this program to track our costs, to store information, to keep our maintenance history, and in particular with the water meters, we'd like to eventually use it to create a overall planned preventative maintenance program and replacement schedule. Uh, and to that, there's a picture here of someone uh, testing a water meter and we have a bench test that we've been testing both old and new water meters to determine what our optimal replacement rates will be to just replace water meters based on age alone isn't necessarily getting us the, the optimal benefit out of this asset. And below that is a water meter box. And I include this because it really drives home the point that there's more than just the water meter that we have to maintain. There's the box, there's the lid, there's the connection to the water meter itself in addition to the water meter. And uh, on the far right, I'm happy to show you our uh, newly acquired GPS equipment. And we're using this equipment to get survey grade location data on all of our water meter assets. And while we're doing that, we're also collecting attribute data such as what kind of a water meter lid does the meter box have? Uh, is it located in a sidewalk or is it located in the parkway? And being able to view all of that information spatially will really set us up to uh, assist us with a, a AMI system-wide implementation. So just to review what uh, the the steps that we've gone through to get to today. Uh, we began looking into AMI in early 2011, I mean, early 2012, late 2011. And as we looked into it further, we realized that we really needed to put some investment into our smaller water meters, that a majority of them needed to be replaced. And we spent time looking into metering technologies, and we developed a bid that made our water meters AMI compatible. And so we have launched the, the water meter replacement project, and, and by doing so, we have put ourselves in a position to be able to go to an AMI, a system-wide AMI implementation much more easily because a huge portion of getting that work is getting the water meters in place that can be connected to an AMI network. Uh, we also did uh, a business case looking at the overall benefits of AMI, and it did show that overall it, it does make sense for us, but at that time we were very much in involved with the drought, and so we determined to continue to replace water meters and uh, continue investigating AMI possibilities. And We've uh, brought you uh, updates on the replacement program several times, and uh, we've brought AMI into the, those discussions. So just to talk a little bit on the background, um, 
AMI has now been around for quite some time. It was actually originally developed for the electric utility industry, but it is being used uh, for many water agencies throughout the country, including some of our largest cities, such as Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., uh, as well as locally. And also uh, recently, some of our closest water neighboring water agencies uh, have approved a AMI deployment for their full system, such as uh, Ventura, Montecito, Carpinteria. Goleta's doing some pilots. And also locally, both our gas and our electric utilities utilize AMI. So it's definitely kind of per gone throughout the whole area. So now I'd like to talk about what exactly is involved in an overall AMI system. Uh, you might think it's something that you just connect to the water meter and that's it, but there's actually more to it. This is a cross-section of a water meter box, and it shows the water meter connected to a meter transmitting unit, and that's the device that actually connects to the water meter itself. This particular configuration shows the transmitting unit being installed through the lid of the water meter, but that's just one option. There are several options available. Uh, there are two main kinds of AMI networks. The first one that was originally developed and therefore the most common is known as a fixed base or a radio frequency network. And so as you can see in the diagram, the water meters themselves are sending signals to the antennas and then the antennas collect the data and send it back over to the water utility. So this does mean that all of those devices would be owned and maintained by the city long term. Uh, there are po potentially some uh, options to connect that network with other, uh, other devices in the future, the whole smart city sort of uh, concept. Another option that has come to light recently is a use of the existing cellular telecommunications network. So this would entail installing a meter transmitting unit to the water meter, and then that would communicate with the wireless network. So that does utilize existing infrastructure that we would not maintain, but it would also mean that we are tied to the, that network and reliant upon that network. Uh, in addition, there is also uh, software that is utilized to process all of this information. So uh, there's an internally facing and externally facing. So on the internal side, there's the meter data management software, and the most AMI vendors offer the validation edit estimate, which is basically the data processing to get the reads ready for billing and for uh, customer viewing. There's also uh, the ability to offer m further analytics that allows the utility to take all that data and turn it into information. Uh, there are also some standalone softwares out there that allow the processing of the data to you know, do different reporting and uh, different targeting of different information. On the customer side, uh, there's websites and Increasingly, more and more, there are mobile applications that people can utilize on their smartphones. And that really goes to the heart of why this is something that's so beneficial for the customer. This is something that allows them to be able to utilize, see their water usage data whenever they would like. And even if they're not in town, they can still see, hey, I know my gardener was at my property today. How much water did my gardener use? And right now, we're only able to offer our customers one data point per month on their water usage. If we offered them hourly data, then over 30 days, that's 720 data points. So that hour offers them a lot more understanding of how much they're really using for different kinds of uses and also the ability to troubleshoot if there's some sort of increased water use issue happening on the property. And I just wanted to also mention that I know with the drought that there's been a lot of focus on water conservation and the use of an AMI system really will help us bridge the use of that metering information with all of the conservation efforts that we have supported 
and we've spent a lot of time educating our customers about water use and by being able to give people that all of that data then they can really tie those with their personal water ethic to actual personal real life experience On the utility side, uh, it really allows us to, one, really manage our customer service relations. Nobody likes getting a high water bill and the ability to be, get in front of that and be able to communicate with cu customers so that they can get ahead of an issue before it becomes severe is really helps us maintain our customer service. Uh, but also going towards the analytics that I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of options. Uh, we can use this data to look at uh, what's our water meter sizing. Is this meter too large? Is this meter too small? Uh, accounting for water loss right now when we produce water, it still takes us a while to get the data back of how much water was sold. So you're not looking at the exact same time as far as when it was produced and when it was sold. So that will help us with water loss accounting, looking at our demands and looking at them spatially, uh, looking at um, where do we need to store water, um, where, you know, where are we seeing that there's more leakage in the system to target capital improvement projects, and also uh, what sort of water pro conservation programs can we use to target specific groups and areas. So moving to what we're working on right now, um, the city has been a member of the uh, IELT Technical Adv Advisor Group, and IELT is a consulting firm. And they specialize in vetting emerging technologies for the water and wastewater industry, and they bring those ones that are ready for market to the, the TAG group, and they offer pilots, and it allows for these newer technologies to be brought to uh, the actual utilities themselves and the, the utilities can learn from each other on which of these newer technologies they might want to utilize in the future. And we, because they have a real pulse on what is happening with technology in the water and wastewater industries, we have contracted with them to conduct an AMI tech scan and a utility survey. So the tech scan is looking at what is out there and providing in a spreadsheet format the different characteristics of the AMI vendors that are, are out there and showing what, whether one, is it even going to work with the water meters that we have now? Oh, what kind of network is it? Is it at the fixed base? Is it cellular? How long will the battery last? And uh, really give us an, uh, an opportunity to be able to compare all of the options out there on an apples to apples basis. They're currently undergoing a utility survey and they're looking at utilities that have had at least one year of experience with AMI and no more than five years, so as to be still relevant to the current technology. And they're being chosen based on what kind of system did, are the, did they uh, install, what, um, how many service connections do they have? Do they have similar topography to the city of Santa Barbara? And we're asking them questions not only about implementing a system, but also what are some of the long-term operational issues and changes that they've experienced with implementing an AMI system. We're also involved in the Alliance for Water Efficiency Research Project, and we're conducting this along with uh, 10 other utilities, and it's going to be providing us with a manual of practice, which is kind of a how-to guide on AMI, and it will also provide us with a template request for proposals that we can build upon, and will also offer us some strategic consulting with their experts on our strategy and a review of our procurement documents, things like that. And it is anticipated to be complete in early 2019. So for the pilot study, we are planning to try both the cellular and the fixed network systems. We have uh, approximately 300 meters that we are looking to include in the study, and we'd like to invite all of you to be participants in that. And we're trying to get a full a representative cross-section of our overall meter population 
Uh, we're trying to get all meter sizes, all meter classifications, and get locations throughout the city. So the, the primary objective is really for us to be able to sort of test drive these technologies and find out what sort of requirements our system specifically will have. We want to know what the har hardware and the software requirements are going to be and how that might fit into our existing infrastructure. Uh, we want to look at the web interface, see what we like about it, see what we don't like about it, see what's going to be best suited for our customer base. Oh, we want to know uh, with the coverage, you know, whether it's cellular or whether it's fixed, there still could be issues with actually getting all of the reads, and we want to start getting a feel for how that's going to work in our service area. And uh, we're going to take all of this experience and incorporate that into our request for proposals so that anything that we learn that is very key to our implementation is included in that document. So this is our tentative deployment schedule. Uh, we are going to be piloting and developing our RFP in 2019. We're hoping to release our RFP in the winter of 2020 and award the AMI contract in the spring of 2020. The full deployment is to be determined and that's one of the other objectives of the pilot studies is to give us an idea of just how long would it take us to actually install these on all of these meters, to test all the software out, and really give us a, a real life experience that we can then scale up to our entire system. So our next steps, we will be presenting the AMI pilot to council in next month. Uh, this will also be br brought back as part of the CIP budget discussion with you guys next month. Uh, we're looking to do the full pilot deployment in the winter of this, uh, this next year, this year. And uh, we will be planning to come back with an update on the pilot in fall of 2019. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there any public comment for this? Anybody? Nope, I'll see none. So, uh, Megan, I know you have time constraints. You get to go first. Thanks. Um, so how are you selecting who's in this pilot? Well, we looked at the tech scan and um, different options for pilots with different vendors. And the two options that we chose are the least cost and also able to piggyback most easily on our existing infrastructure so that it takes the, the minimal amount of invest investment in order to conduct the pilot. Um, same similar question, other side. Uh, how are you selecting, you said you wanted to do 300 homes. How are those, or 300 meters, I guess, how are those being selected to get that cross-section you want? Uh, we're trying to select some people based on, you know, like water commissioners, council members. But overall, we're really just trying to get that representative cross-section, um, you know, out of how many meter sizes do we have, what's a representative number of a 5 eighths inch meter, of a 3 quarter inch meter, and then also looking at the classifications, and then we're going to try to spread those out. So once you take all three of those into consideration, it, it'll allow for it, who will be included. So I guess question, are you going to be targeting specific users, or are you going to kind of put it out to the public and then select among those who have an interest? So we're going to do that selection okay. uh, randomly, and then we're going to communicate with them. Got it. Uh, we are looking for people who will be active users who are interested in it, because I think we really want to get that feedback. Uh, we are planning a survey, so we're going to get their initial input on kind of their thoughts on water, and then also have some type of follow-up with that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, sign me up. Um, yeah. I've, <laughs> it sounds like uh, Chair Jordan's there, too. Um, I've been you know with I think since the beginning of the discussions on this one and um, you know it was it wasn't time before but it sounds like it's time now I'm really excited and appreciate your guys's efforts and sticking with this over the years and I think this will be good and excited about the pilot so thanks so much thank you other questions comments Mike oh, I just had a question uh, way back when we first started looking at this thing one of the ways to transmit the data was to piggyback I think we were talking about was it Edison at the time is that still an option that you guys are looking at, or is that? Uh, that was actually with the gas company. Yeah. And uh, we just had recent talks with them, and it sounds like the gas company may be backing out of that arrangement. 
So it's still kind of on the table, but it doesn't sound like it's very probable. Okay. I mean, it looks like we have other options. I was just kind of curious about that. Um, had a couple questions. Um, the new portal you were talking about, does that integrate into the existing city's existing website for like bill pay and usage or would that, do you have to redesign everything you've got? For the pilot program, it would be just its own st standalone. But long term, yes, we're, it's very important to us to have a, a single sign-on and to integrate that with our, our bill pay system. How exactly that's all going to work is, is not really, we don't know those details yet, and that's another good reason for trying out a system and starting to have the, those con conversations with the vendor to find out what's really involved to make that happen. Okay, and then at some point are we going to see some type of uh, report or executive summary on the tech scan and the utility survey and how you got to what your re recommendation is, or are you just going to come and say you did all that and show us your recommendation? I mean, all that information will be fed into the RFP, so it may be something we'll bring back okay. comprehensively in the fall. I mean, just something to see, just kind of like something may say, oh, no, that, that, that one that you didn't select that has that component on it really seems like it's a really good deal. How do we get that over there? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just I always worry that you guys look at it from provider out rather than user in. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and then just a couple comments. Um, it's what, what I usually comment about. You missed an opportunity in the meter program discussion to, again, um, uh, promote the uh, online web payment. So uh, I, I think you just, I, I, I got to believe that's the least expensive way for you guys to collect money is when I go online and pay with a credit card or link to my bank account every month rather than handling cash or mm -hmm. mailing something back and forth. And so anytime I think you're talking about the meter program, you know, globally, I think you should be waving that flag to, to continue to talk about signing more people up to that uh, electronic. Because I can actually see data on there, too, one point a month. But it begins to get people um, initiated into that's where we want to go in the future. You know, we, we want you to be looking at this remotely to be engaged that way rather than just wait for a paper bill once a month. And, um, and then the other comment is this takes so long. Why, why, why is it still over a year away to almost two years? So, so Mr. Chair, I mean, we do appreciate the, the comments on the presentation because we will be giving this to council, so we want to make sure that it's, it hits the mark with that group. So if you think of other comments in the presentation or in the staff report, we'd we love those. But, yes, this has certainly been one of those things that we're pushing, been pushing. Part of it is resources to just get it, get it out the door. Part of it is wanting to get that experience with the system and make sure that we are, when we ultimately make this decision, which is going to be a, likely a 20-year commitment, that we've made something that we feel like uh, we're not second-guessing or wishing we had gotten something else. Okay. So we, we do believe with you know, deploying 27,000 endpoints, we want to get it right. Yeah. Um, if, it take, if we can do it in less time, if it's pretty clear what we need to do, certainly we'll expedite that. But we've been trying sensitive because certainly I've been asking them, can we do this faster? Can we do this faster? But it's, it's really... Yes, we could, but it, we start to sacrifice the outcome if, if, we, if we rush this too fast. And I, I know we had put this on hold in the drought, and we all were kind of like, oh, you know, but it was the funding is also the, the issue, too, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, deployment of this is in the $6 million range, um, and we, we believe we have the funding to do that now. And so that'll be part of the November CIP discussion that we'll be having with you and, and talking about how we, we propose taking this on, too, without – without driving up rates. Okay. That's our, well, you asked for it, that, that timeline graph is a horrible, a horrible graph that okay. goes all the way back to 2011, yeah. December 2011. It's like eight years later almost, yeah. right? So yeah. seven years later. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Nothing? All right. Thank you. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. And we'll move on to uh, the next item, which is the uh, CCWA, CCRB, and COM updates. Ms. Dyer, welcome back. Thank you, Chair Jordan, Water Commissioners, Councilmember Friedman. Um, I'm going to just give a, a brief update on the three JPAs uh, that the city is a member of. Um, Councilmember Friedman is on the board of CCWA, and Kristen Snedden is on uh, CCRB and COM, and then they're both alternates to each other. So... Um, Starting with COM, it was announced at the last board meeting 
um, that ID1 is no longer a member of COMB. So an agreement uh, was reached for the separation of ID1 from COMB. Um, the COMB board also approved selecting Wardard and Curran to perform a Kachuma um, water quality and sediment management study. This is a really important issue resulting from all the impacts of fire to the watershed. We've had declining water quality as well as increased sedimentation. And so this purpose of this study is really to characterize the issue and then see if there's anything that can be done at the lake or within the watershed to try and mitigate the impacts of fire. We're, we're hopeful that the study will be a, a stepping off point to have a discussion with the Forest Service about forest management, these things that we've been kind of stymied with them. They don't have any funding for it, so hopefully it'll, it'll help. Um, and Comb staff, as well as uh, member agency staff, the city in, uh, participated in the, a meeting with uh, Reclamation to get more information on the cost overruns and the deficits that occurred from FY15 to 17, um, and uh, here are options about payment schedules. We can pay those down sooner than later to try and avoid interest, and so that's, I think, the approach that the city is planning on taking is just paying paying down our deficits. Um, we had money budgeted for the emergency pump project this year, um, so it's looking like that project could probably be delayed until ne next fiscal year. Um, but in the event we have to make some, uh, I guess, and if we're assessed for costs on the emergency pump project this year, we may have to come back to council for additional funds uh, to cover that project. Um, for CCRB, uh, still awaiting a final, white, uh, fa final water rights order. The state um, had some closed session discussions over the summer, but no date has been set for any public hearings or public discussion on the matter. Um, and for the biological opinion on steelhead trout, uh, Reclamation and NIMFS continue to work together. Um, they're currently working on a revised proposed action, and they're really working towards the goal of trying to reach an agreement and avoid a Jeopardy opinion. So those discussions are ongoing. Um, for CCWA, uh, the State Department of Water Resources sent an email to the county saying that they would approve a contract reassignment from the county to CCWA. This was an issue that was discussed um, with the city about a year ago, and all of the member agencies of CCWA unanimously approved um, moving forward with the contract reassignment. Um, it was sort of on hold for a while, waiting for this uh, written approval from DWR. Uh, now that that's received, uh, CCWA will be discussing the matter with the Board of Supervisors probably as early as uh, sometime in 2019. Um, there's also um, a couple of uh, contract amendments. One's a, a contract extension and financial amendment, and the other one is a water management amendment. Both of those are in process and going through public hearing and review right now. Um, but at some point, um, I think we'll invite CCWA staff to come and talk about those amendments um, uh, and what they mean at a later time, maybe this winter. Um, and then there was also, there's been quite a bit of discussions because the State Department of Water Resources has also had a lot of cost overruns. Um, they went over budget by about $15 million, which is uh, two times higher than what was budgeted for some of the transportation costs. And um, CCWA has really been pressing um, the state on what was, why why did we have these cost overruns and what was it for? And they found that about 70% of the cost overruns were due to indirect costs, which would be staff time that was spent really on statewide or system-wide costs that were then allocated to our reach. Um, so 
that's, in, you know, it ended up being about a million dollars for this fiscal year that the city would have to pay. So we're, again, going to use budgeted funds um, to pay those off. We had money in the drought fund for supplemental water purchases. So we'll be using those funds to pay off these cost overruns. And I think based on how we've been trending, if, you know, if this winter continues to be dry um, and we do need to pursue supplemental water purchases, um, I think if we can get comparable prices to what we got last year, we might be able to still stay within budget. Um, but that'll depend, and we may have to come back to council for additional funds if, if we, uh, if we need them in order to pursue our, our uh, supplemental purchases. So, unless there's any questions, that was the, I think the key points from the, the recent board meetings at those three agencies. Okay, we move right along to the subcommittee report. Yeah, Mr. Chair, actually, I, I ask that uh, we put this on, on a monthly basis to hear both back from the <laughs> ad hoc that I'm serving on in terms of sea level rise and also the other ad hocs that, that are coming up. And thanks, Megan, for letting me be on this one. It's, it's been interesting. We um, have a, a large committee. We've got um, two planning commissioners, two harbor commissioners, two parks and rec, council members Friedman, Sneddon, and me from the Water Commission. Um, we've met uh, twice a month since August. The first two months have been basically been education as to what's the issue of sea level rise with some preliminary information as to what's it look like for the Santa Barbara coastline. Um, by and large, the, we're using state-generated uh, information relative to the level of sea level rise. Um, um, the targets right now that we're looking at, two and a half feet by 2060, and almost seven feet by 2100. Um, what that means is everything from bluff top retreat, you know, uh, paring back the bluffs uh, along uh, shoreline drive, uh, shoreline erosion, bluff erosion, storm waves, tidal flooding, storm flooding. In the latter two, the tidal flooding and storm flooding basically inundating El Estero, Desal, and all the way up to the Ortega uh, water treatment plant. Um, significant really significant impacts. Um, we have, again, spent most of the time on education. We have these preliminary vulnerability assessment maps which have been done. Next Tuesday, we're really start, we're actually getting into the vulnerability assessment that the consultants are preparing. By the way, there are two consultants, both physical uh, and scientific as well as economic. And the economic numbers in terms of replacement for facilities whenever off the scale. I mean, it literally off the scale. So it's really going to be a very interesting um, talking about how to communicate to the public and as well as decision makers, how you deal with something as significant as this long term will be um, uh, very dramatic. Um, our next meeting, like I say, we're going to get some updated vulnerability assessments. That's on Tuesday. We're starting to talk about the guiding principles. Uh, and again, as you can assume, a principles for adaptation, protect it, hard protection, accommodate it, siding designs, uh, retrofitting existing structures, retreat, move out, move out of the area, and in most cases, some hybrid of all of the above. And that's really where, where we're going to be looking uh, to some guidance in the next couple of weeks, coming back uh, on November 13th with some potential strategies as to how that plays out for Santa Barbara. Eric, you want to make any other comments? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Dave summarized the work we're doing. Um, it's really complex with the modeling that we've looked at. Uh, we are putting that up on the city's website for the public. Yeah, I, I did. I did mention that. And, and Joshua, uh, if I could or you could send out that that link to the to the commissioners, mm -hmm. because all the information we did vote to put all of our information out public even in advance, all the working documents and whatever are all on the website, so anybody can take a look. The PowerPoint presentations are there. They're simple so far, and you can run through them pretty rapidly and see, see where things are. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Davis, I do appreciate you so much attempt being part of that committee. Uh, it um, I did get a chance to look through your last slide presentations, and it, it kind of triggered a discussion with community development on it because I felt like there was a lot of focus on the 
physical facilities of El Estero and DSAL and the Ortega groundwater treatment plant, but missing from the discussion was probably a of equal and importance value is the utilities, the underground pipelines, because um, one of the things they were focused, they had all the, you know, El Estero was somewhat elevated around the area that it's in, and it sits on, I think it's about 2,000 micro piles that keep it from sinking into the, uh, the uh, ground there, but it, so it does in some ways is protected from s the first initial uh, 2060 projections, but the issue is you're talking about inundation of Cabrillo, and in that sense, you've gotten, once you get seawater into the wastewater system, into a lot of our, we have a huge trunk that lungs, runs along Cabrillo, you basically shut down El Estero anyway to protect it from the seawater, because that seawater would decimate the bacteria that we rely on to treat our waste. And so, uh, in essence, you don't have that, it's not, it's not really about just protecting El Estero, and uh, the only way to protect those utilities in many ways, which is fascinating, is you can't have anybody living in that inundation zone because then I can go ahead and seal the pipe up. Otherwise, you have to keep those penetrations and you have to have the manholes so that uh, in case of any type of backage, it doesn't come up through people's houses. So it really got the discussion going, I think, for them, understanding the gravity of this decision about what we need to do is going to be here sooner rather than later. The idea of retreating is 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 very significant, and I don't know when exactly the, the discussion about what it takes to protect some type of sea barrier, that kind of stuff, and what the pricing on that. So I think that's part of the exploration of the committee. So thank you for, for your involvement on that and for representing water resources. It's been really interesting. If you look at our average high tides are five to six feet, and you add seven feet on top of that to 12 to 13 feet, you have know, the potential with, especially with the fact that storm surges happen at the same time we have winter flooding, you're talking everything below the freeway essentially being inundated. Um, in 2100, it becomes a regular occurrence, not just during major storms. And so, yeah, we got we got a big challenge as a community ahead of us. What was it was interesting when I was talking with community development and I, and I asked him, you know, how does this compare to the old El Estero that used to exist, the old? Yeah. Right. And it basically maps exactly. Right, so course. if you were to pull out the old uh, historic <laughs> El Estero, that's exactly the mapping of the area that would be inundated with some a few exceptions because of the 101 acts kind of like a, a dam in some places. But, yeah, yeah. really fascinating. Anyway, we'll keep you updated, and, you know, Kristen, Eric, and I will, on a monthly basis, as stuff does come forward, we'll, we'll bring it back in some reform. Okay. Go take a look for yourself. Thanks. All right, let's move on to the Water Resources Manager Report. If you don't mind, Mr. Chair, I didn't, there was anything in here that wasn't, wasn't significant in my mind uh, to point out, so if there's any questions, we can take a few minutes if you guys want to look questions, through it. Questions, comments on uh, anything you read? Get you out of here close to 11 then. Mm -hmm. All right. Then we will adjourn and see you next month on Thursday the 15th. Okay. Thanks. And you're not going to be here.